Hi, I'm Matt Young and I'm here with Pint of Science Nottingham. Uh, today joining me we've got uh, Khalil Thurway, he is a PhD researcher in immunology and today we're just going to be talking to him about science and why he got into it. So, jumping straight in, how did you become interested in science? Like thinking back to when you were a young kid, uh, little Khalil, about yay high, what was it that, uh, was there anything at the time that um, got you interested? I think it was ants. If I, if, if I think back to my earliest memory of wondering like what was going on with stuff, something, I think it was watching ants scurry around and being like, where do they go? Like, how do they talk to each other? Like, because you know, they, you know they, they wander around and they follow trails and they pick up food. And I, I remember as a kid, I would just, like, in the summer, I'd just sit and watch the ants and follow them around and try and follow them back to their nest, but then I'd always lose them somewhere. So it was a, it's a sense of, like, childhood curiosity, you think, that got you going? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, what gets a lot of people into science is, you know, there's that, there's that stereotype that scientists are really just children who didn't grow up. You know, that a lot of people, when they grow up, they lose that curiosity. But I think as, as nerds, we just gained, we, we gained even more curiosity. We're like, oh, I, I want to follow, not only follow the, the uh, ants to their nest, but, you know, I want to go inside the nest and see what their stru uh, social structure is like and what chemical messengers they use. And, you know, as we get more into our scientific career, we you know, get to answer those cooler questions. Excellent. Yeah, that's, uh, I think it's a really good way of putting it, that... Uh we're the nerds who uh, don't really lose our curiosity. Um, but arguably not many people do, they just don't, just don't apply it. Um, but when you were, say, like coming towards like the end of school and you were going to go to university, what um, made you decide, yes, I'm gonna go do science, uh, a science subject? Did you always want to go into one particular field? Or was it more of a, is there something else that swayed you towards it? Well, within, within science, I was always definitely a biologist. Um, I, I was good at and I enjoyed the questions in physics and chemistry and finding out, finding out kind of, you know, what light was and you know, how molecules stayed together and stuff. But what, you know, what really fascinated me was life. Because if you, if you look around us, we, you know, we think we're so great inventing cars and computers and light bulbs, but we still haven't invented, you know, stuff that is as complex as, for example, uh, the chemical processing in uh, the metabolism of, of an animal, or the data processing in a you know, mammalian brain or something. So I, it just felt like I wanted to see how nature had managed to do it so much better than us. <laughs> okay, so um, did you have any um, role, role models as such in science? Is there any people, people who you identified when you were younger um, as being involved in science, has that in inspired you to go further into it, or was there not really anyone in pop culture that you could that you were aware of? I mean, I grew up in Britain, so Attenborough was a big part of my childhood. It still is a big part of my life. Um, but then, you know, in terms of actual research, I think when I was young, I didn't I didn't really know that much about the world of research. Arguably, I still don't. <laughs> and so I think that I was mainly drawn towards the science and then I went into research as a means to, to get deeper into science. When I was a small kid, I didn't really, you know, didn't really have any kind of reference of researchers. Did you have any uh, sort of preconceptions or ideas of what a scientist was like or what work as a scientist would be like as yes. a kid? I thought it would be a lot easier than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think it would be all sort of white lab coats pouring different coloured chemicals into different things all day, or was it a little bit more complex than that? Uh, well, I, at various stages in my life, I've, of, I guess I've had different preconceptions of what a scientist's life is like. Um, I think as a kid it was definitely that, or it was um, you know, uh, sticking a squid in a maze and giving it a prod and seeing what it would do. Uh, but then even before starting my PhD, I think that I thought that the that life was going to be more kind of uh, using big questions and doing the experiments about those big questions rather than the actual day-to-day -day grind of being a scientist is dealing with the minutiae and taking tiny little baby steps 
And it, it, sometimes you, you have to get used to the kind of scaling your expectations back from, you know, oh, I'm going to change the world in a, in a year, to being like, okay, no, I'm going to incrementally find out little layers of information and build those eventually into what might be a big story. So I think patience is something that I have to learn. Patience. So it's, you're saying it's more about the little steps on the way, it's about the smaller discoveries that will build towards the bigger picture is what, so you kind of have to get Yeah, because what, what you learn about is the, the big things like, you know, the, the theory of evolution or, you know, um, Boyle's law or you, know, you learn about the big ideas early on in your science education. And so you think, okay, well I'm a scientist, I'm gonna come up with a law and call it Thurlow's law. <laughs> but what you don't you know, what you don't actually get a sense of when you learn about science is you know the the years and years and decades in many cases of hard graft that go into these big ideas. Thinking about your journey so far uh, into becoming a scientist, uh, now in your the final year of your PhD, um, what is, uh, did you have any unexpected things uh, that you learnt along the way, or any sort of key mo defining moments for you in uh, your scientific career so far that's really stand out for you? Defining moments. Yeah, I think, well, I think an early defining moment in my scientific career was um, watching Alien, because <laughs> That really is what made me properly fall in love with parasites. Um, so I'm an immunologist by trade, but by love I'm a parasitologist. Um, and I really like, especially within immunology, how parasites in the immune system interact. But yeah, I think watching Alien, because it had that complex life cycle with all the different stages, and you know, in, it had the egg and the larva and it, it's inside the, the host. So that was an initial sounds weird, but it's an initial uh, <laughs> pivotal moment. Another was in undergrad, I had a really good uh, supervisor for my literature project called Mark Viney, and he was a parasitologist. Um, but he really helped me kind of on my road towards a PhD. Within my PhD, I would say that, yeah, probably about halfway through my PhD, when I started getting really scared that, you know, I hadn't achieved you know, half of a PhD's worth of work. Um, but actually, when I thought about it, you realise that the PhD is a training process. You're learning to be a scientist. And so you're not expected to just instantly be amazing as soon as you start. So there's kind of a, an exponential return when it comes to your growth as a scientist. So you start off poodling along, learning, but still kind of, you know, not great. But then it, it, there comes a tipping point where you suddenly realise, actually, no, I can do this. My experiments start to work more than they don't work. And, you know, when I try new things, I have the, the reference points and the mental equipment to make them work. Um, so that was a very important moment, when I went from being rubbish <laughs> to being very quickly kind of competent. I'm not going to say I'm good, <laughs> but rubbish, from going from rubbish to competent really was a turning point. So realising yourself and actually I, uh, I have learned something and then realising you were actually putting it into practice pretty well, well enough to get something out of it. Yeah, it's like that bit in The Matrix where Neo wakes up and goes, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> I know immunology. <laughs> um, so kind of on the sort of note of the journey, um, first part of the question, looking back at yourself like five years ago, if you had 30 seconds to give yourself like a little bit of advice, what would that advice be to five years ago, Khalil? It's a long, long game research. So, A, don't be too stressed out and disappointed in yourself if it doesn't all come together instantly. And B, that doesn't mean you can slack off from the beginning. <laughs> you do need to put the work in at the beginning to enable your work to work at the end. Yeah, and then five years in the future now, where would you like to see yourself, or where would you think you would, uh, you're going? I love science. I am not in love with the job of research. And I think that I could, I could contribute to science outside the lab. Um, so I think in, for example, science communication, uh, there, there's a real, 
a real drive to basically educate the general public about science, which is what part of science is, uh, pint of science is part of. Um, but also, you know, I've done a bit of work with radio and, and writing. Because, you know, no matter how high our big ivory tower of science climbs, if the general public don't understand it, then it's almost worthless. Because, you know, if people don't understand transgenic organisms, or stem cell research, or, you know, climate change, then the policy makers are going to base their decisions on you know, the, a low level of, of understanding. So when it comes to the people in power, and also the people who vote them there, then I think that it's very important for the, the, the general public to be at the, the baseline level of science to, to kind of rise. So you're saying the, um, the pursuit of knowledge really is uh, almost not worth it if that knowledge is not being shared and shared properly. Yeah, what's the point in knowing something if only you know it? Very, very, very good point there. Gives us a lot to consider. Um, so, what I want to ask you next um, was that if you weren't a scientist now, so say, um, given your current you know, your interests and everything, if you couldn't be a scientist, what other job would you be doing, or do you think you would have gone into? If we're going probability-wise, I probably would have been I probably would have ended up a saxophonist um, because I I played the saxophone and at school my teacher was. I you know, don't want to blow my own sax, but I, I, I was pretty good. And my teacher um, was you know, trying to persuade me to kind of get really more serious about it. And I didn't. And I concentrated on the science instead. So I think if I hadn't concentrated on science, there's a, there's a strong chance I would have ended up a jazz saxophonist. Which would have been fun. That's quite interesting because uh, you have uh, something in common with a lot of scientists there, is that a lot of scientists um, have also been in the past or are currently musicians as well. A uh, popular example being Brian Cox, who before he became a scientist actually used to be a part of a pretty big band. So yeah. that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> well, thanks very much for talking to us today, Khalil. Um, if anyone else is interested in hearing more about Khalil and his research into immunology, you can catch him speaking for uh, the Planet Earth event that will be running the 23rd to 25th of May at Rough Trade in Nottingham. So, yeah, look out for us then.